Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we are taking a part two look at the giant company that is Nestle. The company that we've already discovered has very aggressive marketing tactics, child labor, and turns a blind eye to torture and even murder. And I'm not joking. Take a look at part one for some context. It's wild and it just, it, it's bad. It's wild, but it's bad. In the meantime, we're going to get straight into part two and talk about their impact on the bottled water industry. Clean water is important. It's a necessity. We can all agree on that, right? Well, here's a problem. When clean bottled water is classified as a human need instead of a right, it allows giant corporations like Nestle to help themselves to whatever water they do find. Nestle's former chief executive officer, Helmut Macher said in a 1994 interview with the New York Times, springs are like petroleum. You can always build a chocolate factory, but springs you have or you don't have. And Nestle, when they first launched Nestle Pure Life Water, didn't have those springs. So they began, well, helping themselves. At the World Water Forum in 2000, Nestle led the way in fighting against defining access to water as a universal right. Nestle and other big corporations won out and government officials around the globe officially downgraded water classification to a need instead, meaning first it could be captured, commoditized, and exploited by major corporations without regard for local populations. Water is a human right. Stop stealing it from communities around the world. When people and companies like Nestle argue water is a right and not a need, it's because they're trying to argue water isn't a necessity. And it absolutely is. But the problem is that companies like Nestle are taking water from poor countries and marketing it to wealthy countries when in truth, the US has one of the world's safest drinking water supplies. Nestle is draining developing countries groundwater to make its pure life bottled water, destroying countries' natural resources before forcing its people to buy their own water back. Now Nestle is moving into Pakistan and sucking up the local water supply, rendering entire areas uninhabitable in order to sell mineral enriched water to the upper class, as well as people in the US and EU. Meanwhile, the poor watch as their wells run dry and their children fall ill from dirty water. Tell Nestle to stop making Pakistan's villages uninhabitable by stealing their water. Nestle's aggressive water grab is already descending like a plague on parts of Pakistan. In a small village of Bahi Dilwan, villagers have watched their water table sink hundreds of feet since Nestle moved in. Children are getting sick from the foul smelling sludge they're forced to choke down. Meanwhile, Nestle spends millions marketing pure life to wealthy Americans, Europeans, and Pakistanis who can't afford to watch their kids grow up healthy. This scenario is played out again and again in countries around the globe, but this is where we should say enough. Dirty water kills more children around the world than AIDS, malaria, war, and traffic accidents combined, and Nestle has a big hand in it. Nestle's kind of like the opposite of Robin Hood, taking from the poor and selling to the rich, saying human water is a right and not a need isn't to try and diminish how important it is, but it's to stop companies from selling poor villagers water because it's needed. If clean water is such a need, give it back to the communities you're taking it from, Nestle. Honestly, this is such a nasty and pretty disgusting move. I've heard about how bottled water gets pushed down your throat when a lot of what you really need is just filtered tap water. But this was news to me. I didn't realize how much bottled water is stolen, at least from Nestle. Yet another thing that's bothered me about Nestle and their bottled water is their greenwashing. For those of you who don't know what greenwashing is, it's marketing something as eco-friendly to seem better than what it is and encourage sales. CBC News covered one of the statements Nestle made and well, why don't you hear it for yourself? Friends of the Earth Canada, the Polaris Institute, the Council of Canadians, Wellington Water Watchers, and EcoJustice filed a complaint against Nestle's Waters North America with the Canadian Code of Advertising Standards on Monday. 
The complaint was filed after Nestle published an advertisement in the Globe and Mail in October that included such statements as, most water bottles avoid landfill sites and are recycled. Bottled water is the most environmentally responsible consumer product in the world. Nestle Pure Life is a healthy, eco-friendly choice. Mira Karun Anathan, a spokeswoman for the Council of Canadians, said the ad violates standards of honesty and accuracy. For Nestle to claim that its bottled water product is environmentally superior to any other consumer product in the world is not supportable, she said in a release. I'm sorry, what? That's so ridiculous, it's almost funny. Bottled water is the most environmentally responsible consumer product in the world. Do I really have to pull up the data for this one to prove them wrong? Do they know how ridiculous this is? Okay, fine, here we go. Here are 22 billion bottles to prove you wrong, Nestle, okay? Just from the US alone, 60 million bottles end up in landfills and incinerators daily. A lot of bottles recycled, sure, but are there billions that are clogging up streams, ending up on Trash Island in the Pacific and finding their way into our oceans and landfills? Yeah, so, uh, mm. How is it the most environmentally responsible consumer product again? Wouldn't like a reusable straw be better or a water filter, secondhand clothes, recycled footwear, just, you know, a couple things off of the top of my head here, maybe I'm crazy. Their water is not an eco-friendly source. Recycling, yes, that's eco-friendly, but Nestle, you're not selling recycling. You are not selling solar power, clean energy, or a recycling plant. You are selling a thing that needs to be recycled. This is just a level of dumb that is really hard to argue with, so I'm just not gonna go on any further. You can make your judgments on that. I also don't want to bore you guys with the sources of their water and go on about that for too long, but in addition to taking from Pakistan, they've paid as little as $524 a year to take water from California, even during droughts. And as controversial as Dasani is, Nestle has done arguably worse. Nestle isn't the only bottled water company operating in Michigan, but it's the most controversial. Pepsi and Coca-Cola bottle municipal water from Detroit for their Aquafina and Dasani brands respectively. They pay city rates, then sell the product back for profit. In Macosta County, Nestle sucks up spring water directly from the source, which water conservationists say does more damage to the flow of streams, rivers, and wetland ecology. Municipal supplies come from larger bodies of water, so massive depletions, they argue, have less of an impact. Nestle's chief of sustainability, Nelson Switzer responds, water is a renewable resource. As long as you manage the area, water will flow in perpetuity. Seems like a real smart chief of sustainability. Is that why children in Pakistan are drinking sludge? We're finally going to get off of the bottled water topic now and talk about some smaller scandals. And I don't mean smaller in terms of importance here either, just in terms of scale or coverage. I'll mention them briefly and move on to the next. And yes, there's that many. I still feel like I've barely scratched the surface, even though we're on part two, just from the sheer amount of shady behavior I'm seeing. But anyway, we'll go in chronological order here, so we're starting with Nestle's actions in Ethiopia. Ethiopia had outstanding debts to Nestle, and they sought $6 million from a long-standing dispute. This was during a famine when Ethiopians were starving, and Nestle didn't back down, insisting that it is in the Ethiopian government's interest to reach a deal as a way to ensure continued flows of foreign direct investment into the country. We are flexible about the timing and the amount, but we are not flexible about the principle. So Nestle really do be out here going to harass an impoverished country for a few million dollars as the largest food company in the world when they make billions a year. They're so hung up on the principle. It's like they forgot how to be compassionate. It wasn't until thousands of emails poured in criticizing the company that they accepted $1.5 million from Ethiopia. In all honesty, they should have accepted nothing or not gone after them for the time being. Seriously, that's like a wealthy person loaning a friend a few hundred dollars. And then when that same friend is starving and homeless, the millionaire comes up to them demanding their money back. This is just another example of just how truly heartless this corporation is. So moving right along in 2007, the Canada Nestle CEO almost faced criminal charges because of price fixing chocolate. Allegations that executives with Nestle, the makers of Kit Kat, Coffee Crisp, and Big Turk colluded with competitors in Canada to inflate prices when first revealed in 2007, after Competition Bureau investigators raided the offices of Nestle, Hershey Canada Inc., Mars Canada Inc., and food distributor Itwall Limited. 
In court findings to find those search warrants, the Bureau alleged that executives met in restaurants, coffee shops, and at conventions, and that Mr. Leonidas once handed a competitor an envelope stuffed with his company's pricing information saying, I want you to hear it from the top. I take my pricing seriously. Nestle eventually settled the charges out of court for just over $7 million, 9 million Canadian, with the Canadian government. Great how they'll harass a starving country for 1.5 million, but fork over 7 million for illegal activity. Obviously, they didn't learn their lesson. Why am I not surprised to be saying that? Because once again, we're battling a fixed pricing suit years later, this time in the US. But I swear to you guys, before I could even read about how they were fined for price fixing, another blurb on how they were fined for it in Europe showed up too. They eventually dropped their appeals after being fined for price fixing in Germany and ended up paying over $60 million for the fixing and over 20 million for exchanging sensitive competitive information. Not a good look there, Nestle, but hey, I guess they stopped caring about that a long, long time ago. In 2015, a Ukrainian TV show apparently refused to hire a Ukrainian woman as the host of a cooking segment because she didn't speak Russian. Turns out the sponsor of the show, Nestle, was the one who insisted on these guidelines. Protesters appeared at one of Nestle's offices. They stood at the entrance with posters. Nestle loves everything Russian, despises Ukrainian. My child will never eat Nesquik because Russification is harmful to health. Children do not like Nesquik because it helps Putin, etc. One of the participants of the action ran on the porch in the mask of a rabbit advertising a chocolate drink and with a toy machine and shouted in Russian, Nesquik rabbit is only Russian speaking. All Ukrainian speaking will be shot. It seems to me that they were trying to appeal to a wider audience for financial gain, even if that meant being racist to the Ukrainians and taking away their cultural identity. As if we didn't have enough proof that Nestle only cares about money, even more evidence of slave labor came to the surface in 2015. Nestle's admission that slave labor is used to produce its seafood sourced from Thailand sets an example for other companies who need to join forces to push the Thai government to clean up its supply chain, campaigner said on Tuesday. Nestle on Monday disclosed forced labor was in its supply chain after a year long investigation found migrants were sold and lured by false promises to work in Thailand's seafood sector, kept in debt bondage and degrading conditions. As much of a first step as it might be that Nestle has admitted this, that's all it is. One small step in the right direction when there's been far more missteps, lost lives and tragedies along the way. Sometimes the net is too heavy and workers get pulled into the water and just disappear, Verit quoted one Myanmar fisher as saying. Another person spoke of barely having enough money to survive despite working on a boat for 10 years. Geneva-based Nestle, whose brands include Kit Kat bars, Perrier Water, and Purina Pet Food, commissioned Verite to conduct the investigation a year ago after a spate of media reports about appalling working conditions in the seafood sector. The company has been under mounting pressure with US law firm Hagen Berman filing two lawsuits against Nestle since August, accusing it of importing fish-based pet seafood from a Thai supplier using slave labor and importing cocoa beans from suppliers who use child labor in Ivory Coast. Industries need to recognize that they have a responsibility to essentially call out governments on what they need to be doing as part of this, said Aidan McQuaid, director of Anti-Slavery International. He said inspections of boats at sea where many of the abuses occur are crucial to ending slavery in the seafood industry, but that was the responsibility of the Thai government. In the end, we don't even get a promise that it'll stop. It's up to the Thai government. And after seeing the denial from African authorities in part one, I'm not too hopeful. I find it frustrating too, how they'll admit to have some slave labor, but not others. How can you even ever expect to progress when you won't even reveal the details to everything? I'd respect companies far more if they came out and explained themselves with total transparency. To put it bluntly, if you're going to be an asshole, be an honest asshole. According to a study done by Mighty Earth, many of Ivory Coast national parks and protected areas have been entirely or almost entirely cleared of forest and replaced with cocoa growing operations. Nestle, Cadbury, and Mars are largely to blame for this. You can see on their map of forest cover how it dwindles to almost nothing, all for the sake of cocoa farming. Sorry, but like, how can you sit there and say on your website, Nestle, that you want to strive for zero environmental impact? 
The damage is done. It's too little too late. You can't say that you want to have no impact by 2030 when until 2017 at least, that's just the most recent report, you've deforested the Ivory Coast in Africa for cocoa, ruining the habitats of elephants, monkeys, and other wildlife that live there. What, are you going to have zero environmental impact because there won't be any forest left to destroy? In that case, you're doing great, sweetie. Now, we've heard about the labor issues, the price fixing, the scandals, all that. I don't think I have to go over Nestle's bottled waters and chocolate lookalikes since I'm pretty sure you've seen them all. But we are about to dive into a few of their products because tragically and unsurprisingly, after everything we've heard so far, Nestle has actually been responsible for several deaths. In September, 2008, almost 53,000 children became sick in China from tainted baby formula, Nestle included. By the time the event ended, six babies died of severe kidney damage and an estimated 300,000 suffered kidney stones. Literal babies suffering kidney stones. I have heard about how absolutely horrific the pain is from these things. And if any of you guys have ever passed a kidney stone, imagine an infant trying to pass one. And now just remember that like 300,000 babies suffered from kidney stones and six died. Six didn't make it through. They didn't make it to live. I can only imagine how devastated the mothers must have been. In July of 2013, the BBC reported that Nestle was going to slash prices of baby milk formula in China, likely because they weren't selling as much after everything that had happened. But Nestle didn't act carefully after that, no. They continued to take shortcuts and put infants' lives at risk. In India, one woman opened a packet of Nestle Saralac for her one-year-old son, only to find worms in the wheat and milk powder. They were weevils, which commonly affect crops. But this wasn't the only case. There had also been moth larvae in milk powder that one mother used for cereal. So can this happen with food products at times? Absolutely. If it were the only controversy Nestle had in its products, I'd really doubt bringing it up. But considering how thousands and thousands of infants got kidney stones from tainted formula, it's worth mentioning how little Nestle even seems to care about the products they push on people. Baby formula is far from the only product they've had issues with too. In June, 2009, the CDC reported that a culture of a sample of prepackaged Nestle Toll House refrigerated cookie dough currently under recall yielded E. coli. Hell, when I was researching the recall, I noticed another time they've recalled the same damn thing. Their cookie dough only last year in 2019 because there's the potential presence of food grade rubber pieces inside of it. The E. coli is one thing. I'm sure we all remember what happened when romaine lettuce wasn't safe for a while. It happens and there's outbreaks in food, but tainted formula, moth larva, weevils, E. coli, and rubber pieces? Either Nestle has some seriously terrible luck or they really don't care. Given the fact that we have more than one example of this, I'm inclined to believe the latter. In 2015, India learned that Nestle's noodles Maggie contained a lead and an amount of MSG that was above the legal limit. Nestle in response claimed that the lead content in noodles is negligible and less than 1% of the fixed limit. It also says that it does not add any quantity of MSG to instant noodles and if present, it might come from naturally occurring sources. The company further alleged that Indian regulators have not specified any limits for MSG to be included in food products. So basically in a little TLDR, they just go, well, that's not that much lead. Um, I'd like to know if my food was made with lead. Thank you very much. Uh, Their response acts as if the Indian government is coming after them. I mean, look, if you've got lead in your food, shouldn't you be apologizing rather than defending the behavior? And in case you don't know how dangerous lead and MSG are in food, here you go. Lead is a highly poisonous metal, whether inhaled or swallowed, affecting almost every organ and system in the body. The main target for lead toxicity is the nervous system, both in adults and children. Lead interferes with a variety of body processes and is toxic to many organs and tissues, including the heart, bones, intestines, kidney, and reproductive and nervous systems. Lead poisoning symptoms include abdominal pain, confusion, headaches, amnesia, irritability, and in severe cases, seizures, coma, and death. Yeah, neither of these things you really want to eat, certainly not in excess anyway. But here, Nestle simply denied wrongdoing, even as the FDA in India said they were exploring legal action against the company. Eventually in 2015, India came out and sued Nestle for almost $100 million over food safety. 
The government said on Wednesday that it has filed a suit with the country's top consumer court, National Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission, for 6,400 million rupees, $98.6 million, in damages from the Indian arm of the Swiss food giant. Our complaint is over their unfair trade practices and the court will now issue them notices to hear their response. G. Gercherin, additional secretary of the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, told AFP News Agency. In a statement on Wednesday, Nestle said that the company has a stringent program to test the ingredients in its noodles. In recent months, we had over 2,700 samples of Maggie noodles tested by several accredited laboratories, both in India and abroad. Each of these tests have shown lead to be far below the permissible limits, the statement said. Unfortunately, in this case, Nestle did not have to pay the fines because they agreed to remove their products from the shelves until they were deemed safe to eat. Really, what happened after in China, I feel like they shouldn't have been given any leeway whatsoever. It could have been much worse and they could have hurt so many other people. I wish no one had to get sick or die until this company got into some serious trouble. As for the present day, there's still been plenty of complaints in recent years. In 2003, they settled out of court for calling its subsidiary of the Poland Spring brand Natural Spring Water. In 2009, the FDA sent them a warning because the labels of the company's children's beverages contained unauthorized nutritional claims, such as their Boost Kids drink preventing upper respiratory tract infections and protecting against cold and the flu. In 2011, Poland Spring had thousands of complaints when a bottling plant in Massachusetts had elevated levels of bacteria. In 2013, they removed beef products from the shelves in Europe when it came to their attention that the beef was adulterated with horse meat. In 2010, Greenpeace International began campaigning against Nestle for using palm oil. In 2005, the International Labor Rights Fund brought lawsuits against Nestle for their mistreatment of workers and their complicity in the torture and murder we mentioned earlier. The list is literally endless. If you don't see how shady and horrible this all looks for Nestle by now, then nothing I really say or show you is going to convince you. At the end of the day, Nestle owns so much that it's pretty much impossible to take them down. And I can't tell you who to boycott, only spread the information and truth about this company. The truth is, I think Nestle started with fantastic intentions. Remember 150 years ago when Nestle was in the business of saving lives? Their founder, Nestle himself, seemed like an amazing man. And I'd like to think that if he could see what his company has begun today, he'd be heartbroken. Nestle has killed infants with a formula that was supposed to feed them. They used child labor for their chocolate, slave labor for their seafood, and have shown complete negligence and utter lack of concern on multiple occasions with their products, the complaints they have received, and the warnings they've been given. We all hear about how awful some giant corporations can be, and it's Nestle that unfortunately proves that stereotype right. Maybe next time you see that little Nestle logo on the package, you'll try to find an alternative. I love chocolate as much as anyone else, but it'll sit better in my stomach knowing that I wasn't eating a product made in part by a young African child that misses their family deeply. So with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. What have you learned from this two-part series about Nestle? If you enjoyed what you learned in today's video, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you want to see more content from me and perhaps see something a little more wholesome, go down to the description box and my second channel is for my puppy Casper. Watch that for a little bit, it'll cheer you right up. If not, you can go ahead and check out my collaboration channel with Sad Milk for some controlled chaos, as well as all of my social media accounts are also down below. So with that being said, guys, I love you guys so much. It was great to see you for another video and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good day, guys. Bye.